Journey to the Centre of the Earth, Chapter 7, The Shore at Last. I don't remember clearly what happened next. Somehow the battered raft reached the shore. The next morning I was lying, feeling half dead on a beach. Hans was his usual silent self, but my uncle was in a worryingly cheerful mood. Sleep soundly, he asked. Oh, perfectly, I said, except every bone in my body aches but I expect I'll be all right. Of course you will, he replied. You seem very happy this morning, I said cautiously. Delighted, my boy, delighted. Now we have crossed the sea and we can plunge further into the depths of the earth. Hearing that, I knew my uncle was even crazier than I thought. Uncle, can I ask you a question? Certainly, Axel. How are we going to get home? Either we will find a new route or we will come back along the same path. I don't imagine the route will disappear behind us, he smiled. He made it all sound so simple. After a quick meal, we decided to work out how far we had come. But when my uncle got out his compass, the arrow pointed the wrong way. We stared at each other. There was only one conclusion. Somehow in the storm the boat had turned around and we had come right back to the shore that we'd started from. Impossible, he said. Maybe we were never supposed to cross the sea, I said excitedly. We thought we were following Sang Newsom's route. But who knows if he crossed the sea? No, my uncle replied. We must set out again. Hans will simply rebuild the raft. While he does, we shall explore. So my uncle and I set out to explore the shore. Before long, we stumbled across an eerie sight, a field full of bones. We trampled over fossils and rattling ancient skeletons while white mounds of bones rose in the distance. There were more dinosaur skeletons in the field than in all the museums in the world, but something more astonishing was to come. Look, Axel, I followed my uncle's gaze and was struck dumb. Before us was the crumbling mummy of what had once been a primitive man. Its black, hollow eyes stared at us. After some moments of silence, my uncle was himself again. Come on, he said, there must be more to explore. Beyond the field was a thick forest full of towering trees. My uncle stepped briskly into the cool shadows. Reluctantly, I followed him. All sorts of strange creatures must have once lived down here. Could they live here still? For an hour we walked in silence before I stopped and grabbed my uncle's arm. I thought I saw. No, I really did see enormous animals wandering under the trees. I heard their ivory tusks as they tore bark from the trees. Branches cracked as great thump clumps of leaves disappeared into their huge mouths. Come on, forward, my uncle whispered. No, I hissed to him. We were unarmed. No human creature can hope to survive those beasts. No human creature, my uncle interrupted. Look over there. I can see a creature who looks almost human. I looked, shrugging my shoulders, determined not to believe him. But there, beneath a towering tree, was a giant of a man, more than 12 feet tall. We stood still for a moment, completely speechless. I panicked that he'd spot us. Run for it, I shouted, dragging my uncle behind me, and we ran like mad until we reached the edge of the forest. Now, when I consider it calmly, I cannot believe what we saw. Our eyes must have been mistaken. No race of men could possibly live in that underground world. We were on our way back to Hans when I spotted a dagger. We must have dropped this earlier, I muttered. So you brought this with you? My uncle asked, frowning. I looked at the knife more closely. No, didn't you? No, said my uncle, and nor did Hans. It's most peculiar. He turned over the rusty knife in his hands. This is from the 16th century. Do you mean? This blade has been lying here for the past 200 years. 
It belonged to a man who used a knife to engrave his name on the rocks. Arne St. Newsome. Yes, he must have used it to mark his name once more on the route to the centre. Let's find it. We worked our way along the high cliffs looking for anything that might turn into a passageway. Eventually we came to, we came to two rocks. Between them was a dark tunnel and there, on a slab of granite, two letters were carved, half eaten away by time. A. S. It was Arne St. Newsome once again. When I saw those letters, all my fears dissolved and I was ready to rush headlong into the tunnel. Stop, we must get hands, said my uncle. Fine, but then we go straight down. Yes, we're getting there. We collected hands and soon all three of us were marching through the tunnel, but after only about 20 feet, we stopped. Bother, said my uncle. Rocks blocked the only way forward. There was no way around them. They must have fallen down since St. Newsome's journey, my uncle said. If we can't beat them, we don't deserve to get to the centre of the earth. He glowered at the rocks. We could get through with pickaxes, he said at last. It's too hard for the pickaxes. An ice pick then. It's too deep for an ice pick. Well then, gunpowder, an explosion. Let's mine the obstacle and blow it up. Blow it up? Why not? It's only a bit of rock. Hands to work, shouted my uncle. So Hans began, hollowing out a cavity for the explosive. It was not an easy task. He had to make a hole big enough to fit a large amount of gunpowder. While Hans worked, I helped my uncle to make the fuse. At midnight, our work was complete. All we needed was a spark to set it off.